Ok. <risa> Este, bueno, empezamos nuestro seminario de topología. Eh, hoy es nuestro último día de seminario en el trimestre de 2021-P, seminario de topología de la UAM. Este, nuestro expositor eh, es el profesor Paul Sheptitsky de la Universidad de York de Canadá. Eh, su plática va a ser en inglés, ¿no? Entonces, al final van a haber preguntas, los alumnos pueden preguntar, ¿no? Y les traducimos. Bueno. Okay, Paul, so whenever you're ready, you can start. Okay. Uh, first, let me just, um, I want to thank Rodrigo for giving this invitation to, to speak. I would, of course, much prefer to come and give the talk in person, but um, maybe sometime in the future I can um, come and maybe not give the same talk in person, but give, um, but come and visit and maybe try to do some mathematics with all of you. Um, I, 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 I understand there's some students here, so um, I'm going to be maybe doing a little bit more background since I have an hour as well. So I can spend a little bit more time on some background and some maybe known results. Um, but please, um, especially to the students, um, if you have questions, please just don't wait till the end. Um, feel free to stop me in the middle. And I think maybe Rodrigo is saying that um, if you want to ask in, in Spanish, if I can't understand, then Rodrigo can translate or something like that. So that's, um, Please don't be um, don't be hesitant um, to ask questions. Okay, so um, first of all, I want to say that this is part of a joint work uh, with William Chen Mertens and um, and Cesar, who I guess is here. I wasn't sure if you were going to be here or not. Um, I'm going to be talking mainly about essentially one example that's um, mainly I think uh, joint with um, with Bill uh, Bill Chen. Um, but I will mention some other um, results of Cesar, um, who also, I think, uh, there's some joint paper that still hasn't really been finished, but needs to be finished soon and submitted. <clears throat> um, and it has some other results in it as well. Um, okay, so what am I going to talk about? I'll first just give some description of some known um, convergence properties that were um, Primarily introduced by Arhangelsky related to Fischer's own property, but um, uh, but not 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 exclusively Arhangelsky's. Um, all, all of them are can be viewed as strengthenings of the Fischer's own property. Um, if there's time, um, I'll discuss some, some other topic about cardinal invariance in the G delta modification of a topological space. So this is an area where you um, take a topological space, and then um, you look at the finer topology obtained by um, uh, taking all the G deltas um, or you know, generated by the G deltas. And there's a, there are a bunch of questions about whether or not you can bound some cardinal um, um, functions of the G delta modification in terms of the original cardinal functions on the uh, on the uh, cardinal functions on the original space. Um, so the example, uh, and then finally, the, the, um, the example that I'm going to describe um, answers some questions related to both of these topics. Um, and so um, I really won't do this in this order. I'll first go into the Fischer Eurozone properties. I'll describe the example. And if we have time, I'll talk about the G delta topology and what this example says in that area as well. Okay, so, um, and then I have this one particular question that I, there should be some answers to, but I'm, one of the, one of the reasons the paper has never been published is both Bill and I are convinced there should be some easy, um, something more that can be said about this example, um, in particular, whether or not it has one particular convergence property. Um, and we're about to give up and just, you know, send it somewhere. So we'll see. Hopefully maybe one of you can add answer one of these questions. Um, okay. So, okay, so let's just go back to the very beginning. Um, uh, a space is for Shea Eurozone. If, um, uh, whenever you have, uh, um, whenever you have, have uh, a set A and you have a point which is in the closure, then you can, um, you can actually find uh, a sequence, uh, a sequence from A converging to that point. Okay, 
Uh, the only reason I give this definition, I assume all of you know it, is just to clarify that for me, a sequence is not a function, but is just a countable subset. Um, and it has the property that, um, uh, that if you look at any neighborhood of the point, which is supposed to be the limit point, it contains all but finitely many points of S. So that means any one-to-one -one enumeration of S um, is a convergent sequence. Okay. Um, so the next um, uh, uh, um, definition is the alpha I properties of our Hangul ski. So I'm really only interested in two of them. The strongest is that X is alpha one. So what does it mean for X to be alpha one is if, if, you, have, um, if you have a single point, um, let, me make my, let me make that point a little bigger. If you have a single point, and um, that's a little too big, one second. I don't know why I care about this, but it's, uh, if you have a single point and you have um, converging to that point, a bunch of sequences. So let's say S1, S2, S3, and so on. You have all these sequences converging to the point. Then um, I'll, write it, I'll write it on the screen in a second, but I'll just draw a picture here. What you can find is um, a single sequence, I'll draw it in red, a single sequence, S, and it has the property that it contains all but finitely many points of each sequence. So the stuff that's sticking out here, um, uh, over here and here, on each of those sequences, it's finite. Each of those sets is finite. Okay. So um, the statement is if x is alpha one if for any x in any countable family of sequences that converge to x there's a single sequence converging to x um, that almost contains so this means that um, s n minus s is finite okay all right so that's um that's the alpha one property so there are, of course, many others, alpha two, alpha three, alpha four. Um, they're all variations of this theme. Um, the only one I'm gonna actually mention and maybe prove something about is alpha three. Um, and the statement for alpha three is that X is alpha three. If for any countable family of sequences converging to X, there's a single sequence S that, um, that hits infinitely many of those sequences in an infinite set, okay? So it doesn't have to even hit all of them, but just infinitely many, and it doesn't contain all but finitely many, but has infinite intersection with each. So you can imagine what all the different variations are and how they might fit together in, um, in implications. Um, but let me make one, a couple of comments. Um, the first is that I'll say, what, I'll say what a P ideal is in a moment, but um, the definition is essentially there. Um, if X is an alpha one point, if the, if the set of sequences converging to, to X, um, which is a collection of countable subsets of X, um, then this forms a P ideal. So um, the definition is really there under the second bullet. Then it just means if there are countably many elements of the, uh, of the ideal, there's a single element of the ideal, which contains all but finitely many of each of the points from the original infinite family. Okay, so just as in as in the second bullet. Um, okay, so that's kind of a, a, a nice observation, at least if you have if, uh, if you have a set theoretic kind of um, disposition. So if you haven't seen these before, then I just suggest you do an exercise. Um, the only one of these implications that requires just a little bit of thought is that first countable implies alpha one, but it's true. First countable implies alpha one. You don't know what alpha two is, so that's maybe an, uh, an unfair exercise, but um, you know what alpha three is, and you can, if you've digested this at all, you can see that it's a trivial implication that alpha one implies alpha three. So all those implications are trivial. Really the only one that requires a little bit of work is that um, first count of implies alpha one, but it's not, it's not much. Um, okay, so probably before I get to my next, second or third slide after this, you'll have done the exercise. Um, okay, so that's the first page of definitions. Um, so 
Ah, so all of these definitions um, came from a really beautiful paper of our Handelsky um, called the frequency spectrum of a topological space. Um, and um, part of the, the main motivation for all of this is if you take a kind of a, a big overhead view of topology and you think about you know, the, the different classes of spaces and wonder what happens to these classes as you um, do different operations. So for example, you might start off with the, uh, just metric spaces or separable metric spaces. Um, and then um, if you take quotients of metric spaces, you get what are called sequential spaces. And then if you go, if you take subspaces of sequential spaces, you get the, the, the countably tight spaces. Um, and so those kind of operations are well understood, but when you take, start taking products, things get, um, things get really um, difficult to, um, to understand. And there, you know, there are lots of theories, uh, attempts to find classes which are closed under products or for which certain properties are preserved um, when you take products within the classes. And um, that, that was really the motivation for all these alpha i properties. The Fréché property is very badly behaved in products. Um, and if you haven't seen this before, I'll just maybe describe the, the main example which really illustrates this and really the main example to really start getting a handle on these um, and understanding these alpha i properties and what they mean and you know, how to how to sort of get a handle on them is the so-called Frechet Eurozone fan S omega. Um, so what does this look like? Well, it, the description is here. You take countably many copies of omega plus one, and you identify all the limit points. So you have this kind of space where you have a sequence, a bunch of sequences. Um, like this, um, they all converge to a single point. And um, it's a quotient space, so you're, you're looking at the finest topology that um, preserves it. These are all convergent sequences. So essentially what it means is if um, that, uh, what does a neighborhood of this point look like? It's really determined by a function. So for any kind of choice of places where you want to cut off these sequences, then you get a neighborhood of that, you get a neighborhood of the point. Um, and so the space is not first countable. In fact, you, you can think about for any, essentially for any function from omega to omega, um, the, the function tells you where to cut off each of these sequences. And so this you could call a u sub f. And it's not hard to show that the space is not first countable. Um, and, but it is for Shea, right? Because if this point were in the closure of, um, of a set, it couldn't have finite intersection with each spine, right? Because if you have something that has just finite intersection with each spine, or like, like, then, there's a, then there's a function that you can define, which you know, there's a neighborhood which cuts off and misses the entire set. So the only way a point can be in the closure of the set is if, um, you know, if, it, if, it, if it has infinite intersection with one of the spines. And then that, then that infinite intersection with the spine is a, is a sequence which converges to the point. So it is a Frechet, it is a for, it is Frechet Eurozone. Okay. Um, so it is Frechet years on, okay. Uh, so, but in fact, any convergent sequence has to be contained in finitely many spines because if it intersected infinitely many, you would have a neighborhood um, that missed infinitely many. And so it couldn't be a convergent sequence. Remember a sequence is convergent if the neighborhood contains all but finitely many of the points. So if it hits infinitely many of the spines, um, the, those convergent sequences, then it can't converge to the point. Uh, I didn't give the definition of alpha four, but that would show that it's not even alpha four. Um, now, I don't know um, if I should uh, give a sketch of why um, omega plus one cross S omega is not for Shea Eurozone, but that's, that's, that's true. You can find this probably anywhere or try to, maybe that's, another, maybe that's another exercise. You can try to figure out why if you take a convergence sequence, which is you know, as nice of for Shea space as you can imagine, 
and this um, the space S omega take its product, it's not for Shea Arizona anymore. So it's really this example that I think um, guided um, the um, our Hangul scheme to look and formulate these alpha I products. Um, okay, please, if there are any questions, let me know. All right, so um, there are two other stronger conversion properties that we want to look at. Um, the next one is um, due to Ernie Michael, and it's uh, the idea of bisequential, which is a really, I don't think, a very nicely, um, it's not a very good name in terms of helping you remember what it means, but uh, it arose because Michael was studying <clears throat> something, uh, different classes of maps, and he had a notion of what he called a bi-quotient map. And the question is what kind of convergence properties are preserved by bi-quotient maps? And so it was formed, I'm not, I'm not gonna state the theorem or what exactly bisequential is in that context, but it arose from that. And so that's why we have this name bisequential because of um, the bi-quotient notion. Okay, so a space is bisequential. So this is the, the definition. If, if whenever you have a filter base clusters at a point X, so I guess the notation is um, um, it, that you, I don't know, I can't even remember what the standard notation is. Is this, is this the clusters at X? I think maybe that's what um, some Willard or Munkries or Engel King uses for that notation, at least from the textbooks. Um, if you clusters at X, then you can actually find um, these finite sets, and then you might as well take them to be, de I'm not, not finite sets, sorry. You might, you can find this decreasing sequence of sets Um, which is um, compatible with you. So that means that each one of the elements of each Fn, um, its intersection with the elements of the filter is infinite. So um, you can find um, such a, a sequence which is compatible with you and this family of Fn's uh, as a filter base um, converges to X. Okay, so which means, of course, that every neighborhood of X contains at least um, contains one of them, which means that it contains a tail of them. Okay. Um, all right. So it should be maybe clear that a bisequential space is for Shea because essentially any selection of points from these FNs would have to converge to X. So if X were in the closure of a set. You could take the neighborhood filter, its trace on that set. Bisequential gives you this countable sequence. And uh, then a selection of points from, the, from that sequence would be a, a sequence conversion to X. So bisequential is in fact for Shea. Um, but um, a little bit more, I Hangelsky proved that if it's bisequential, then it's for Shea alpha three. And um, it has another stronger property, which is nice, that, that X remains a Frechet point point in the stone check compactification of X. So that's his, his notation for this is it's absolutely Frechet. Uh, equivalently, it just remains a Frechet point point in any compactification, but it's maybe convenient always to look at the stone check compactification <clears throat> when, when possible. So this bisequential property is, a, is, a, is a really a strong a uh, strong form, a strong version of um, uh, a strong version of the Frechet property. Okay, so um, so maybe I could. I, I was planning on uh, how is my time going. I, I could give a proof of one of these. So maybe since I will talk about absolute Frechet, but not necessarily alpha three, let me just maybe talk about why bisequential spaces are um, absolutely Frechet. So. If you have um, X being bisequential, and if you take any points in X, it really only, you only need to prove that if X is a bisequential point. So it has that, the bisequential property is, um, uh, is satisfied just at X. The whole space doesn't really need to be bisequential. Then if you take the stone check compactification, X is still um, uh, for sure your own point in the stone check compactification. Okay, so how does this go? Okay, so since it is a Frechet point in X, we really only have to check that if X is in the closure of some subset of the remainder. 
Um, so if X is in the closure, we wanna look for a sequence from A, which is converted to X. So we need um, A ends in A and the A ends, that sequence converges to X. That's what we're looking for. And we'll, you do the same thing that you do when you're proving that um, bisequential spaces are for Shea. You look at the neighborhood filter traced on, um, you look at the same idea as the neighborhood filter. So here we're gonna do something slightly different though. We're gonna just gonna look at all neighborhoods of A um, um, traced on X that are in, um, that are in beta X. Okay, so that's a, that's a, um, that's certainly a filter in, um, um, in X. Um, and um, it certainly clusters, this filter clusters at X too, okay? Because a, um, X is in the closure of A, so it would have to be in the closure of each of these elements. So using, um, using bisequential now, we can fix um, a sequence of sets. Um, so it's a filter base generating a filter which converges to X and um, with this filter. Okay, so uh, maybe I'm just sketching here a little bit, but you can now show that the closure of Fn you know, intersected A is not empty. And then you do the same thing. You look at, um, uh, you take any choice of points from Fn closure intersect A and check that that converges to beta X. So again, I'm not really giving a full proof. I'm just giving the sketch, but this is the idea. So you can try to check to see if that's, um, if you can figure out these, these steps. Okay. All right, so I have also a proof that bisequential spaces are alpha three. Um, and really uh, by now, you've, you hopefully you've done the exercise that first countable spaces are um, alpha one. And if you have done that exercise, it's really the same idea as that proof. I'll, I'll just, I'm running a bit short. We started a bit late, but I don't know if we have time to go into all of these proofs, but um, one second here, I'll just make sure I have the whole proof up there. Okay, so if you want to, you can take a screenshot or you can go back to the YouTube and, and look at this. If you can't figure out the proof yourself, but um, the, the main idea is, again, comes back to the Shea Eurozone fans, so I'll just mention that. So if you're, and then we'll, I'll leave it at that, but if you're bisequential and you have these, um, family of sequences converging to X. So we, we have something in X that looks like the Fouché Eurozone fan. We have all of these sequences. I guess they, may, they don't have to be disjoint, but I'm drawing a picture as if they were disjoint and they're all converging to this point X. Um, of course, the neighborhood filter at X traced on these sequences may not look like the Fouché Eurozone fan. It, it could be, it would be, it'd be usually coarser than the Fouché Eurozone fan. In fact, it will be in this case. Um, but you can take the Frisch Eurozone fan filter. You can think about um, looking at all of the, the UFs that you get from the Frisch Eurozone fan. And then that is a, a filter which converges, in fact, converges to the point, so clusters at that point. And now if you use the bisequential property, you can find these uh, sequence of sets that are compatible with the, the filter generated by the UFs. Um, that converges to X. And then you can go through and choose points in such a way that you hit each of these, um, uh, that you hit each of these um, uh, spines, um, not, not each of them, but hit infinitely many spines in an infinite set. And it's actually, you can write it down without, without too much difficulty. Um, and that would be the sequence which converges to X. Okay, so I, I didn't really explain that very well or very completely, but the idea is there about the, the filter you start with to apply by sequentiality in order to extract the sequence. Okay, so by sequential spaces are also alpha three. All right, so our Hangelsky had some questions um, and um, the two of them that I'm interested in is one number, first one are that are absolutely for Shea spaces by sequential he asked. And he also asked are alpha one for Shea spaces by sequential. So um, the example I'm going to describe is a consistent example that um, answers both of those questions with a single example. So it's consistent um, 
that there is an alpha one absolutely for Shea space of size omega one that's not bisequential. So I'll try to give a, a, as complete a description of the space as I can. Um, the other example that's in this paper that we're writing up is essentially due to Cesar and is related to some other examples that he has in a paper with um, Michael Hrushak um, using almost disjoint families. Um, so they have a ZF, uh, so he, he modified, I think one of the examples he had from, from that paper and produced a ZFC example of a countable absolutely for Shea space that's not bisequential. So the first question um, has a negative answer in, 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 in ZFC. Um, um, but I won't, I won't talk about this example. Maybe you can uh, ask Cesar to come back and give a seminar about those results, or maybe he already has, I don't know. Um, but I do want to talk about um, this first example here. So let me just mention, though, um, that you can't expect to get a countable um, example in, in ZFC um, that is even alpha 2, because it's consistent that countable alpha 2 spaces are first countable. Um, so if you're looking for a, a ZFC countable example, uh, it won't have uh, it, you can't expect it to have the alpha two property in CFC. Um, it, it, you might be able to give a consistent example of uh, an alpha two, um, maybe absolutely for Shea space that's not bisequential. So that might be <clears throat> maybe a nice, um, I haven't actually thought about that, but that might be a nice question. Can you get a consistent example of a countable alpha two absolutely for Shea space that's not bisequential? Okay. Um, so I'm just going to now start um, to and describe this um, this first example. Maybe I'll pause so I can fill up my teacup um, and I ask if there are any questions at this point. Everyone's very quiet. Um, oh, I can see someone's face. Thank you for turning on your video again. <laughs> okay, let's go on. Okay, so let me tell you what a, a square a square kappa sequence is. Okay, and I'll give some examples um, in this, um, and, and, and talk about when these things do or don't exist. Um, so a square kappa sequence um, is a sequence. Okay, good. Of, um, of sets indexed by kappa. And the first property is that if alpha is a limit, then C alpha is a closed unbounded subset of alpha. So um, it's closed in the order topology and unbounded. Okay. Um, if alpha is a successor, so I write it this way, so anything of the form alpha plus one, then C alpha plus one is just the largest element, um, uh, singleton alpha. And they're, they're coherent in the following sense. Um, if I look at one of these C alphas, and if I have beta, which is not just a limit ordinal, but a limit of C alpha. So that means that C alpha intersect beta is a closed unbounded subset of beta. So anytime you have that situation, then, then C alpha intersect beta actually has to be C beta. So you have this, this really coherent family. Okay, so one way to get such a family is just to start off with a club subset of kappa. So take a closed unbounded subset of kappa. And then um, for the limit ordinals of, of C, let C alpha be C intersect alpha. And for other, or, for other ordinals, you can, you know, it's, all, it's a non-stationary set, so it's relatively trivial. You can kind of take almost anything at that point to, um, to glue it together. But um, you, um, if you do this, then that will give you um, a sequence that has these three properties, one, two, and three. Okay, I'll describe, in the case where kappa is omega one, that's a special case, I'll describe in second, another example of a square kappa sequence if kappa is omega one. Okay, but the fourth bullet here says that, um, that uh, C is not, is non-trivial in the sense that, I mean, the sequence is non-trivial in the sense that it's not, generated by a single club. So that's the last statement. There is no club C, so that C alpha is C intersect alpha for all limits of C. Okay. 
So that's the, um, that's the definition of a square kappa sequence. It's um, a sequence of closed unbounded sets um, for the, when, when alpha is a limit. Uh, we don't really care what happens when, when for successor ordinals, but just for completeness, we'll say it's a singleton. Um, it's coherent in the sense that if you take a limit point of C alpha, then C beta is just that intersection. And it's non-trivial. There's no club C which generates the whole sequence. Okay. Um, some examples. Um, a ladder system on omega one. So if I if I for each alpha in omega one, if I take C alpha um, cofinal uh, and, and an omega sequence in alpha. Then it has no, all of its elements are isolated, and they're all isolated points in C alpha. So there are no limits. So three is, um, is vacuously, um, holds vacuously. And it's clearly non trivial because if you take a club subset of omega one, some initial segment will not have you know, uh, a, very, a very short initial segment, um, will already have um, order type omega plus omega. So it can't be. Uh, um, it can't be generated by a club. So a ladder system on omega one is a special example of a, a square kappa sequence. Okay, and, um, and under some assumptions like V equals L, you have square kappa sequences for all regular uncountable kappa. But that assumption is necessary. Um, because it is consistent, something called the um, P ideal dichotomy implies that square kappa fails for all regular kappa bigger than omega one. Okay, so, um, so the P ideal dichotomy has something to do with these things and alpha one spaces give rise to P ideals. So there's some, here's the first kind of hint of some connection between these things. So, um, so let me, um, uh, I, I, I'm, I'm not going to give a proof of this theorem of, of, of Zorchevich's, but um, the idea in the space is really a, a, is inspired by that proof. Um, associating to a square kappa sequence some p ideal, and then that p ideal is used to generate to construct a, a alpha one topological space. Okay, so how do we do this? Um, so P ideals and for Shea alpha one spaces. That's the next thing I want to talk about. So, um, so what is a P ideal? I think I've already, I, I waved my hands at the definition, but let me write it down here. So a collection of countable subsets of some, of some cardinal kappa or some set um, X, it's not important that it's a, what the underlying set is, is a P ideal if um, whenever you have um, a countable family taken from that ideal, there's a single element of the ideal which almost contains all of it. So if you have I0, I1, and so forth, um, then you can find um, a single element I uh, um, that almost contains each, which just means that the stuff sticking out, the stuff sticking out here is finite on each, on each asset on each IN. So it really looks exactly like the, uh, the picture that we draw for, for alpha one spaces. And there's an observation, yeah. So if X is, an, uh, is a for Shea alpha one point in X, then the countable family, uh, the family of countable subsets of X that are convergent sequence to X is a P ideal, okay? just straight from the definition. So it's, it's really the same idea, but um, in, a, in a different language, language topology of the language of, um, of um, set theory. So there's a converse observation too. If you have a P ideal, then there's a natural alpha one topological space you can define um, on um, kappa plus one. How do you do this? You, um, first of all, you isolate all the points of kappa. Um, so we have um, kappa plus one. So we have this the point on top is kappa. So all of these points are isolated. And um, 
what is a neighborhood of the, the one non-isolated point? It's just any set that almost contains all the elements of the ideal. So I suddenly switched from capital I to capital S here, but um, I want to think of these as the convergent sequences. Okay. Um, and if you do that, then kappa is a Fourche alpha one point in X. And since it's the only non-isolated point, X is a Fourche alpha one space. Because all the points are, um, all, the, all the other points are isolated. Okay, um, very good. So um, how do you get a P ideal from a square kappa sequence? So uh, Todorovic proved that the P ideal dichotomy implies that square kappa fails for every regular kappa bigger than omega one. Like I said, I'm not going to prove this. I'm not even going to state the P ideal dichotomy, but I will explain how you get a P ideal from a square kappa sequence. And, and it's the application of the P ideal dichotomy Economy, which then shows that that square sequence would have to, uh, you get a contradiction um, that uh, on, about the non-triviality of the square kappa sequence. Okay, so um, like I said, I'm not going to prove the theorem, but I will explain what is the p ideal that one associates to a given square kappa sequence. Okay, and, and I should point out that. Um, you know, it, of course, if kappa is omega one, then this association is still there. So you do get natural um, um, p ideals um, associated to these omega one sequence, but the p ideal dichotomy doesn't produce uh, a um, uh, a contradiction in that case. Okay, so there is uh, the row functions of Todorovic are used to um, to do this. So. Um, we're going to assume we have um, that this is a, a square kappa sequence. Although we really only um, we only really need that it's a coherent sequence. The pro the, the interesting properties of this row function um, come from the assumptions about the sequence. But you don't really need any assumptions on the sequence itself, other than that each one of them is cofinal in in uh, that each C alpha is cofinal in alpha. Uh, so if you know that all the C alphas are cofinal in alpha, then you can define this function. So I'll tell you what the definition is, and I'll give the, the intuitive definition, although let me assure you that there is a formal um, uh, inductive definition of this, of this function. So what is it? Rho to alpha beta is the number of steps in the walk from beta to alpha along C. Okay, so here, of this this function is is um, is going to be symmetric, so we really only care about the definition of um, of um, rho two alpha beta. Even we don't really even care about what it is for uh, for alpha equal to beta. So strictly less than. Oh, I'm getting some Apple News spotlight. No, okay. Um, so we really only care about the definition for alpha strictly less than beta. If alpha equals beta, rho two alpha beta would be zero. But what do we mean by the number of steps in the walk from beta to alpha along C? Oh, okay, so here we have um, alpha down here. We have beta up here. And then we have um, my, my C sequence, my, my um, uh, square kappa sequence. So uh, we start off and, looking, and we look at, uh, we look at uh, C beta. So C beta has some stuff below alpha and has some stuff above alpha all the way on. Let me give myself some space here. And then, um, and some stuff above alpha. And it's called final and beta. So the first step of the walk is the smallest element. So this, this what I've drawn here is C beta. Okay. So I look at C beta and I look at the smallest element of C beta that lies above alpha. And that's the first step of my walk. I guess uh, I can call this uh, beta one. Beta is equal to beta zero. And this is the first step of my walk, uh, uh, beta one. And then I look at C beta one. Um, uh, and again, C beta one has some stuff below alpha and then has some stuff Again, let me give myself some room so I can draw more than one picture here. Some stuff above alpha. 
and it's cofinal. It has stuff above alpha because it's cofinal in beta one. And um, and then I, I take I take the next element below that. So let me choose another color here, and that's beta two. You know, and if I ever hit a successor, remember C if for a successor ordinal, um, C alpha is just the, the immediate predecessor. So you just do one quick step down. But eventually the sequence will terminate at alpha. And the length of the walk is the number of elements in that sequence. Okay. Um, I'll only need this definition once because I'm gonna use this row function as a black box for most of the properties. Um, but there's one moment where I'll remind you of this definition um, because we'll need it um, to prove one thing. Okay, so that's, um, this is really a, a remarkably beautiful idea. Um, it has lots of incredible applications. Analysis of these kinds of row functions can be used to construct Arenshein trees. Um, Justin Moore's L space is, um, a, arises from looking at these types of row functions and other functions associated to different structures that you get from looking at this. So not only is the sequence of, not only is the length of the walk important, but the sequence itself and the sets that lie below. So the, the lower trace it's called, this, this, this stuff um, that accumulates below when I take the intersection of these C beta I's with alpha, um, those, are, those sets are important as well. Um, and that's the, this is what's involved in, for example, Justin Moore's L space um, and lots of other beautiful results. Okay, so that's the definition of the row function. And here are some, like I said, I'm just gonna black box this a little bit. I mean, these are the, some basic properties of, the, of this row function. It's called row two because there's a row one and there's some other ones, but um, these, the, the coherence of the square kappa sequence, uh, um, implies that the row functions are coherent as well. So if here, what, what this means is I'm of course fixing the second coordinate and thinking of this as a function from alpha to omega. So row two dot alpha is a function from alpha to omega. Row two dot beta is a function from beta to omega. So I can restrict it to alpha and then it becomes a function from alpha to omega. And what's true is for any alpha less than beta, um, these functions are almost equal. So the um, row two beta restricted to alpha agrees with row two alpha um, at all but finitely many points. Okay. And the non-triviality of the square kappa sequence tells us this, this kind of remarkable um, uh, property that this row two function on pairs of uncountable sets takes on every um, takes on um, in always infinitely many values in omega. So it's, um, it's key in proving um, some very strong fail failures of the Ramsey's theorem at omega one. Um, so it means if you take any pair of, unbound, of unbounded subsets of kappa, so kappa is assumed to be regular here, so sets of, of cardinality kappa. And if I look at any natural number, um, then you can always find a pair alpha beta, alpha from A and beta from B and row two alpha beta is above N. And so you have, um, you have this kind of um, um, surprise, very surprising result very, and very, very useful and um, uh, powerful result or property. And um, and the p-ideal that one associates to the um, to uh, the square kappa sequence is just all the countable subsets of kappa. So that if you look at any one of these row functions where you fix the second coordinate, and if you see how it acts on S, it's always finite to one, right? And because uh, because these row two functions um, agree with each other on a finite set. If it's finite to one for some alpha above S, it's gonna be finite to one for all of them. Right? So the, the set of the uh, 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 countable subset of kappa is in the ideal if these row functions restricted to S are finite to one 
uh, as functions from S to omega. And this is a P ideal. So I'm not going to prove this, but that's, um, that's really the, the main one of the steps in the proof that the P ideal dichotomy implies that square kappa fails. Um, this is the P ideal the one applies the P ideal dichotomy to. OK. Any questions, or are we OK? Or we're all either. Either we're okay or we're all lost. I hope I'm not lost. Okay, so we already know now by that, um, by those observations I mentioned earlier that if you have a P ideal, then you have a Frege alpha one space on kappa plus one. Um, but there are different ways of viewing that, that space. So um, one of them is the way we de described it before. So this is the family of sequences convergent to kappa. So if you remember, this means that um, um, uh, the points of kappa are isolated. So we have singleton alpha is always open. Um, but if, if U has kappa in it, then, um, then S is almost contained in U any time you take S from this P ideal. Okay, so that's, that's one way to define the space. Uh, all right. Another um, another way to define it is to define a neighborhood base at um, at at the point kappa using the row function. Okay. So here's the idea. So we, in fact, what we really do is we define a neighborhood base of kappa of the point kappa on all the subspaces, which are the initial segments of the space. So if I have, if I have kappa here, and then this kappa in the top, and if I take some alpha, um, I look at the row two function where I fix alpha on the second coordinate, and I look at row two um, as a map from alpha to omega. And the um, UN alpha is, um, is just all the betas below alpha where row two beta alpha is bigger than n. Okay, so this UN alpha is, oops, I didn't mean to do that. Um, this um, UN alpha is just all the points here where row two beta alpha is bigger than n. So that tells me that if I look at, if I look at the point kappa, and I only look at the subspace, the points less than alpha, that that subspace of those isolated points along with the non-isolated point kappa, kappa is actually a point of first count, is, a, is first countable in that subspace. So that's one of the nice properties of the subspace. So let me just, uh, I didn't finish writing down the definition of the topology. So, um, oh, okay, so yeah, let me be a little more clear. So one way to define the neighborhood base at kappa is for every alpha, you fix one of these UN alphas, you union them all up, and that's a neighborhood of, of kappa. So we have kappa here. For every alpha, you fix one of these UN alphas. Looking down, you choose a different, you choose, um, you choose a, a natural number for each alpha. And then you union all those up, and that gives you a neighborhood of the point kappa. Now, the, the properties of the row function tell us that, in fact, any such neighborhood looks like this. So another way to describe the neighborhood base at kappa is just take one of these un alphas at some alpha, and then take the tail of the space. So what it says is these kinds of, these kinds of sets cover a tail of the space. Okay, I'm, I'm running short on time here. So let me, I was gonna give a little proof that, um, that, that these two definitions are equivalent. Um, and it uses primarily- well, You uses could also take uh, like other, another five minutes because we started late. Yeah, I know, but I only, that gives me just 10 minutes. So I wanna make sure I get to it. But um, the, main, the, main, the main tool is the, this, this bit. If I have two unbounded, um, 
if I have two unbounded subsets of kappa, um, then um, there has to be a pair where rho to alpha beta is above n. Um, if one of these sets did not cover a tail of the space, then that would mean that there's some unbounded subset B, which is in the complement, and then you would get a contradiction um, from, this, from this property. So the fact that these two are the same um, uses very strongly, um, sorry, uses very, very strongly uh, this property. Okay. So why is this space absolutely for Shea? So one of the main properties, again, let me go back up. Um, let me just get rid of all of this writing and um, just point out one thing. If you look at the space, I'll, I'll, I'm just repeating something I said before, but if you look at this description of the space, it's clear that kappa is a point of first countability in, in every initial segment of the space. Okay, so if you look at a subspace, which is an initial segment, then kappa is a point of first countability in that subspace. The other thing that's true is that every neighborhood covers a tail. Of, of kappa. So it looks a bit like the one point kappa Lindelofication, um, but it's not just the tails, there's the tails and some stuff that reaches down below the tails. Okay, so why is this space absolutely for Shea? So um, what I wanna prove is that if kappa is in the closure of some subset of beta X, then there's a sequence from A converging to X. Um, so let me first point out that without loss of generality, we can take A inside of beta X minus X. Well, because if, if, um, if kappa is in, so I'm just really proving that kappa is a Frechet point in, um, in, the, in the whole space. So if kappa is in a closure um, for a um, subset of kappa, and let me just um, also say that here I'm going to use the first description of the space. I'm going to, for every alpha, say that I can fix a un alpha. Um, to define a neighborhood. So if uh, kappa is in the closure of A for A subset of kappa, if, um, if kappa is not in A intersect alpha closure, let's suppose it's not in the uh, um, closure of an initial segment, that means that for every alpha, I could find a U and alpha of alpha whose intersection with A intersect alpha is empty. Right? If, if UN alpha of alpha, if you, have a, if, you, if you have an alpha where all of the UN alphas intersected with the initial segment is not empty, then um, kappa would be in that, the closure of that initial segment. But then this says that the union of the UN alpha of alphas uh, intersected with A is empty, which means that kappa is not in the closure of A. Okay. Right. So if kappa is in the closure of A, then it has to be in the closure of some initial segment. And we just mentioned that in, in that subspace, which is an initial segment, kappa is a point of first countability. So therefore there is a sequence from the initial segment which converges to kappa. So the whole space is for sure. Okay, so we can assume that we know the whole space is for Shea, so now let's prove it's absolutely for Shea. Okay, so how do we do this? So we're, we're taking P now to be in beta X minus X, I mean, A to be in beta X minus X. And um, now the first observation is that this is well-defined. Okay, so of course, if P is in beta X minus X, then P is an ultra filter on, on, on kappa. But remember the point kappa 
it, every neighborhood contains a tail of the space. So that means that this ultra filter has to concentrate on an initial segment. Right? If every element of P was unbounded, then um, the space uh, wouldn't be Hausdorff. You wouldn't be able to separate P from Kappa. And so if, if, if every element of the ultra filter had cardinality Kappa, then P and Kappa couldn't be separated. Therefore, P has to concentrate on some initial segment. So that's, and let, we let alpha P be the minimum alpha that has alpha um, as you know, alpha of course is an initial segment. Uh, so that, that set is an element of the ultra filter. So I claim that kappa is in the closure of some A gamma, which is the set of all P's in A where alpha P is less than gamma. Um, so again, I'm looking at all the elements in A that, that concentrate on, on a particular initial segment. And I claim one of those sets has kappa in this closure. And if that's, if, if so, then um, A gamma is in the closure Okay, this is bad notation here, but we take the initial segment gamma and we take its closure in beta x. Kappa has countable character in that, in that subspace, in that dense subspace gamma. So kappa will have countable character in the, in the closure of beta x of that initial segment. And so there will be a sequence from A gamma converging to kappa, which is what we're looking for. We're looking for a convergence sequence in the, in the set that converges to kappa. So if kappa is in the closure of some initial segment, then we're done. And I, so I claim that's the case. Okay, if not, all right, I'm gonna go through this for running again at a time and I wanna say one more thing after this. Um, then we have the following situation. If you, uh, then we know that kappa will have a neighborhood which is disjoint from each of the A gammas. So that means we can do the following. For every P and beta bigger than alpha P. So if I look at beta, and if I have this P, which is in A beta, there is a neighborhood of kappa, which misses this. And that neighborhood of kappa is given, by, is given by some N. It's the set of all Cs, which lie above N. So that neighborhood, if I take its, if I take its closure in the stone check compactification, doesn't have P, doesn't have P in it. So that means that the set of Cs where rho two C beta is less than or equal to N has to be in P, okay? Because, because there's a neighborhood that misses all of those, okay. So there's an N beta P where, in fact, because there's only finitely many values below N, um, it has to be equal to some N beta P, some fixed value, okay? Now, um, if the supremum of the n beta p's for alpha p less than beta actually equals omega, so I'm gonna gloss over this a little bit because I'm running out of time, as I said, then kappa would actually have to be in the closure of that initial segment. Okay, so if I look at, a, if I, if I look at the n beta p's as alpha p ranges below beta, then um, the, if the supremum of that was equal to omega, then you could argue that every neighborhood of kappa would have to pick up one of those using the UN beta initial segment description of the space. And so um, um, we would have kappa in the initial segment, which is a contradiction. So that means that there's an upper bound for all the N beta Ps. And then that gives me a neighborhood of, of kappa, which is disjoint from A. So kappa is not in the closure of A. Okay. All right, so um, that's the proof that it's absolutely for shade. So this is the question I, I really, that we're, we're left with. Um, is there a square kappa sequence where kappa plus one with this topology, I guess, I guess we want it to be not bisequential. But I, we, we're having trouble proving, finding any good, we only have essentially one, one result about, about this question. So can you find square kappa sequences where this space is bisequential? Can you find maybe a square kappa sequence where, the, where this is not bisequential and what happens just for omega one. So all we have is um, one, one consistency result for omega one, luckily in the right direction, but it's um, under the assumption of some weak version of diamond. There is a ladder system, so that's a square omega one sequence. 
where this topological space is not um, bisequential. And I'll just quickly say what it is. Um, so this is the pla only place where I wanted to remember the definition of row two. If beta is in C alpha, right, then the walk from alpha to beta has one step in it. Right, because if, if here's beta, here's alpha. And remember rho two beta alpha is constructed by taking the minimal element of C beta that's bigger than or equal to alpha. So if alpha isn't, if, I'm sorry, I have beta, oh, I have this switched around. So alpha is on the top, sorry, and beta is below. So alpha is here and beta is here. If beta is in C alpha, then this, the walk from alpha to beta has one step in it. So rho two beta alpha is one. So diamond implies that there's a ladder system such that for any countable family of stationary subsets of omega one, SN and an omega, N and omega, sorry, that's, um, that should be omega here. Uh, there is an alpha where all the C alphas intersect. I mean, C alpha intersects all the SNs. So that tells me that the neighborhood at alpha um, misses, if I look at, if I look at U2 at alpha, that won't contain any of the SNs. So no sequence of stationary sets can converge to kappa. So then if you look at the club filter, which clusters at kappa, if I were to find a countably generated filter which converged, all those sets would have to be stationary. But no countable sequence of stationary sets converges to kappa for this C sequence, for this um, square kappa sequence or ladder system. Okay, so I think that at least I described the example. I, I went over time, I apologize for that. Um, the same example answers some questions about the G-delta topology related to this question of Bella and Spadaro. Um, is there a bound on the tightness of the G-delta modification of countably tight spaces or countably tight Lindelof spaces? So I don't think I have, I have time to really go into that, but um, so I will, I will stop. Sorry for going over time. <laughs> Thank you very much, Paul. Uh, it was really, uh, it was a really interesting talk. Uh, so now let's uh, wait if any, anybody has any questions. Alguna pregunta? I see some questions in the chat. Oh, okay. Oh, no, there. It's just that Sergio had to leave and he says, saludos. <laughs> no questions? <laughs> okay, thank you, Paul. Uh, so I'm going to